My name is Nancy. For those of you who did not catch that, I got my master's degree in entomology from the University of Georgia. And when people ask me what bug did I study, usually they ask me like what species did you study? But I did not study a specific bug. I studied how to talk about insects to the public. So during my time at UGA, I did a lot of teaching and my favorite things to talk about were ecology. Surprise, look at where I ended up. <laughs> so this presentation is going to be about insect ecology. When we think about insects, where do we think about them on the food chain? A lot. a lot of poor insects, right? You know, sad day. Uh, but that's not necessarily the case. In the southern United States, praying mantises will sit on hummingbird feeders and they will take down, kill, and eat hummingbirds. Take that, bird people. <laughs> um, we have a thing here that lives in the river. It's called a giant water bug, mainly because it's a bug. It's giant and lives in the water. It will eat anything it can possibly fit into its face, including small turtles, frogs, oh toads, snakes, lizards, fish, and other insects. Wow. Om nom nom. And recently I saw a video on Facebook of a huntsman spider from Australia dragging a mouse up a refrigerator. So, now, insects aren't quite at the bottom like we thought they once were. They're floating somewhere in the middle between predator and prey, which leaves a very interesting question to the insects. How do I communicate to my mates? How do I communicate to my species while still remaining hidden or giving mixed messages to my predators? And that's what this presentation is about tonight. This presentation is walking the middle ground between predator and prey. This is a majestic creature that I took a picture of in the primary forest up here, uh, here in Maki. It's a really small insect. It's about, um, it's about five millimeters long or about a sixteenth of an inch. This is its eye. Here are its three legs. This is its wing. And they all have a little thing on the top of their head called a helmet. And most of them look like little dried sticks or leaves or maybe even thorns. Obviously, one small insect on the side of one small plant is not particularly convincing. So when you find them, you usually find them in groups of 20 or 30 together, and that together makes the plant look spiny. So tomorrow, when you're walking around or when you're walking around the Amazon, take a look at the plant that has spines, because those spines might have legs. And we have to get through one slide of science before we can have fun through the rest of the presentation, although, because you're all like, biology-ish majors, except for the one engineer I talked to. You might know this, but if not, review. If you are talking to the same species, this is called intraspecific communication. This is a real spider doing a real behavior in a real place. That place is called Australia, so go back home and look for these things. Uh, he is about five millimeters long. Again, he's really small. And he is waving his legs around because he is trying to attract a mate. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, this, yeah, this is a real thing. People ask me all the time, they're like, is this an animation? No, this is part one of that is not photoshopped. <laughs> so, he is waving his legs around because he is trying to attract a female. He is sending a visual signal to the same species. This is intraspecific communication. If you are trying to talk to someone else, this is called interspecific communication. This is a, uh, a monarch caterpillar. We have monarchs here in Ecuador as well. They are non-migratory. So you can find them, same species and everything. This yellow and black and white banding pattern is telling predators back off, don't eat me, I'm toxic. If you eat me, I will be dead, you will be sick, everyone will be sad, please just leave me alone. Okay, thanks, bye. The way I remember this, inter-specific communication goes between different species, like interstates in the United States go between different states. Unless, fun fact, you are Hawaii and you are on the interstate system because you wanted government money. American politics. <laughs> so, my favorite thing to talk about is this idea of secret messages. This is all about butterflies and their coloration. This is why I ask you to take pictures for me when you ask me what is that bug. These are two different species of butterfly and they look basically the same. I will give you that. Um, the difference between these two very similar looking species are these eye spots here and here. The itis blue has slightly smaller eye spots than that of the melissa blue. We know that this is important for their mating because we took pictures of the itis blue butterfly 
we put those pictures in Photoshop, we made those eye spots bigger, we printed out the altered photograph, showed the altered photograph to females of the Melissa Blue, who then tried to mate with the altered photograph of the wrong species. So, butterflies are conveniently not very smart, good for us. <laughs> it makes experimentation a little bit easier. Similarly, these are two other butterflies that look basically the same. The checkered white is slightly whiter than that of the western white. Again, we know that this is important for their mating because we took pictures of the checkered white butterfly. We darkened up those dark patches in Photoshop. We showed the altered photograph to females of the western white who then tried to mate with the altered photographs of the wrong species. So, small differences to us are big differences and a big deal to butterflies. That gets one up here in the tropics. You have probably seen them today walking around. If you didn't see the Heliconius butterflies today, I have no doubt that you'll see them tomorrow, and I have no doubt that you will see them in the Amazon, so fear not. These are four different species of Heliconius butterflies. They look pretty similar, basically the same, and that's because they're all saying the same message. This yellow and black and orange banding is telling predators back off, I'm really toxic, please don't eat me because they're all sending the same message, they all look similar to each other. Unfortunately, they all look similar to each other, not just predators, they look similar to each other as well. So the butterflies need a way to tell each other apart, and they do that through this yellow or in this white banding pattern, they reflect ultraviolet iridescence. So we can't see it, but the butterflies can. So they aren't even looking at the color patterns on the wings. They're just looking at the very specific patterns in which UV light is bouncing off of those wings. You can see this at night if you find a sleeping butterfly, you can shine a UV flashlight on them and this yellow area just lights up. And so you can kind of see what the butterflies are seeing. This is the star of this area. This is the Morpho butterfly, but this is the boring brown side that no one talks about. <laughs> This side of the butterfly is a very normal story. Butterflies have a series of scales on their wings, that is how they produce their color. On this side of the butterfly, the scales are infused with a pigment called melanin, which should sound familiar. It makes people brown, it makes butterflies brown, just makes things brown in nature. So this is the boring brown side, but it has a very usual story. Scales infused with a pigment, you get a color. This is the side that everyone talks about. This is the shiny blue side, and on this side of the butterfly, these scales are completely clear. They're transparent, they have no pigment, they have no color. So, how do you make blue from a structure that has no color? You can see that it, the scales are clear here. You can see through the wing, through the clear scale, through the wing membrane to the color on the other side. So, how do we do this? Physics! Who here likes physics? Everyone, my engineer is going to like physics. <laughs> so these are the individual scales that make up the coloration. Now you know I'm not lying. This is the structure that gives the scales their strength and shape. And we're down to, we're down to one micrometer here. This is the structure that gives the scales their color. Light enters this little structure, it gets stuck, and it bounces around until the light can only come back out in a straight line. That straight line is what makes the butterflies iridescent. That straight line is what makes the butterflies blue. This is the same structure that makes this laser pointer work. It's the same structure that make our commercial LEDs work. Our commercial LEDs, if you want to go to Ikea, I don't know if you have Ikea in Australia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> of course, Ikea is everywhere. So if you go to Ikea and you get like a crappy LED light from Ikea, they reflect six or 7% light out of their structures. This butterfly reflects 80% light out of its structures. So there's a lot of money right now going into studying these structures uh, so that way we, we can copy them for improved fiber optics, security encryption, shiny paint is a thing that people want. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I have no doubt that you will see these in the Amazon. And you will know when you see it because it's really just a bright flash of blue flying by. Here's a video I took which shows you a little bit of the shift in the iridescence. As I change the camera angle, you can see the iridescence shift a little bit. And that has to do with the, the way, the angle at which those little staircase structures are placed. So that becomes really important for my favorite butterfly, which is the pearl morpho. This is what it looks like. It's kind of camouflagey. Yeah, it's a little white butterfly. 
Someone took this picture, they went into a museum, they opened up the drawer, they went directly overhead, and they went click without any flash. And this is the picture you get. But, my brilliant smart students, you should be saying to yourself, it has the same structure as the other Morpho butterfly, so it should be shiny. And it is, if you look at it from the side. So what's happening is this butterfly is like flapping around through the forest, and other butterflies that are flying at the same horizontal angle as it are seeing these bright blue flashes for mating. Overhead predators, like birds, if the butterfly's at rest, fly directly overhead, look straight down into a butterfly that disappears against the background. So at the same time, you can hide from your predators and signal to your mates using just structural engineering. Here's a video I took. It's in a glass box on a vertical wall, so my angles are backwards, but you can still see as I change the camera angle, this iridescence disappears. Wow. Wow. This butterfly you can find here in Ecuador. You have to go south in Cuenca in the mountains to go find it. Or in Machu Picchu. I heard that they're also in Machu Picchu. Mm -hmm. Some insects just want to be seen all of the time. This is part two of That's Not Photoshopped. This is a real moth on a real dude's face, though I do not know the dude. More impressive than its size, it's the Atlas moth. It has a 30 centimeter wingspan or a one foot wingspan. More impressive than that is the fact that it has these snake heads on the side of the wings. So why do you have a bug that's looking like a snake? Well, snakes eat birds and birds eat bugs. So if you're a bug, it can look like a snake. Hopefully, the birds are going to leave you alone. <laughs> this is an elephant hawk moth caterpillar. You can find it in Europe. It doesn't look like that much until you scare it, and it poofs its head up, and it curls its body around to look like a viper. These are not eyes. It's not a nose. It's not scales. It's just coloration of the insect. It's literally like someone painted on it. <laughs> but you guys have the chance to see one as well as a different species lives in the Amazon. So as this guy like shakes the stick, it poofs its head up. You can see his little caterpillar feet just hanging on here. Yeah, uh, so this is the back. This is the, this is like the front end, but the caterpillar's hanging upside down. So this is like the underside of the caterpillar. His head is protected up in here somewhere. Yeah, they're, they're pretty big, yeah. you know, small snake sized. So they're convincing as a small snake. What was the question? I said that would convince me. That would convince you? Yeah, no, it's pretty amazing. We have a couple of butterflies here too that have a really interesting behavior where the hind wings have what look like little antennae, and then so the hind wings will move, and it looks like uh, the back of the insect has antennae that are wiggling, and it's really convincing. It, it tricked me the first time. <laughs> this is a chrysalis. This is the most vulnerable stage between the caterpillar and the adults, non-mobile, and so it needs to pack some pretty powerful defenses. This one looks like a snake. This is from this area. It's from Mindo, which is only about an hour away. This is not an eye. Again, it's not a mouth. It's not scales. It's nothing. It's just coloration of the insect. It's like someone painted it. We saw this one tonight. This is the owl butterfly. If you open it up and you turn it upside down, this is what it looks like, convincing as an owl, especially because the one we saw was small. They can get up to be about that big. It's a butterfly. At night, the sleeping butterfly will turn upside down and it will open those wings up to give this owl-like impression. You can look like something that's gross. This is a swallowtail caterpillar. It looks like bird poop. You can find this, these here in Ecuador. You can also find species that do this in the United States. This is a spider from California. Here's its head and its four legs all mashed up together and its butt. They look like bird poop because poop carries diseases. So birds tend to stay away from their own poop. Convenient if you're a bug. This amazing example comes from China. Here's its head, uh, its body, its first wing, and its second wing, what looks like bird poop down here at the bottom, and two houseflies pointing down and eating that bird poop. This is part three of That Is Not Photoshopped. If you do not believe me, here's its species name. It does not have, uh, it does not have a fancy, fancy common name. Sorry. 
You can always look like something that's angry and fights back. This is another reason why you need to take pictures for me because I, as an entomologist, am looking at things like eyes, antennae, and legs, whereas you guys are probably just looking at color. This is not a bee. This is a fly. It is completely harmless. It lives in the, in the United States, although we have some down here as well. This is a beautiful creature that's basically a centaur. It's called a mantis fly, but it is neither a mantis nor is it a fly nor is it a wasp. It's in its own group of insects that are unrelated to those groups. These insects are afforded protection because they look like things that can hurt us. We just see these shapes and these color patterns and we're like, you know, good, we're good. We don't need to look any further. So they're afforded protection because of this. This is a spider from the cloud forest here in Maki Pakuna. Uh, here are its four legs, one, two, three, four. It is using its first pair of legs like ant antennae. So it is not just a visual mimic, it is also a behavioral mimic. I am often asked, why is a spider looking like an ant if spiders are already venomous? Well, to that I answer, when you find one spider, you just find one spider, but when you find one ant, there's usually thousands behind it, and most predators just don't want to deal with that. So they just leave the spider alone just because they think that there's more other scary things behind it that look like that. How big are those? Um, I actually don't know how big these species are. Uh, it seems to be mimicking a, a group here that's related to the bullet ant, but is a little bit smaller, so it's probably about that big. It'd be scary as like large stinging ant. And I love this example from Singapore because it shows that you do not need venom and you do not need toxins to develop a mimic. This is a tiger beetle. This tiger beetle has some pretty good defenses, but none of them are chemical. The first defense is that it has this really hard shell that's difficult to peck or bite through and generally just not worth it. If something does try and attack it from the front, it has these big teeth at the front that it uses to just bite the thing until it leaves it alone. And if you think you're safe coming from, from the back, it uses its legs to kick you in the face until you leave it alone. So it's not toxic, it's just not worth eating. This is a katydid, which is closely related to crickets and grasshoppers. And it is a perfect snack. It has a nice soft abdomen for eating. Uh, it has these soft, these small mandibles to chew soft leaves. And it has these legs that are modified for jumping. So even though this beetle has no toxins, it's still obnoxious enough to not be worth it that it can develop its own completely harmless, completely tasty mimic. And sometimes you don't have to look like anything at all. This is an assassin bug. Here's its eye and its antennae and its straw-like mouth part. It walks up to an ant, stabs its mouth part into the ant, sucks the ant dry, and then tosses the dead ant on its back and walks it around like a living graveyard. Why? Well, its main predator is a jumping spider and the more dead ants it has piled on its back, the less it looks like food to the jumping spider. So it's not trying to look like anything at all, it's just trying to be unrecognizable enough, you know, to not be eaten. And this is a Madagascar and hissing cockroach, they're really beautiful, some zoos have them uh, for outreach, some people have, have them as pets, they're like a good 4 5 inches, I don't know, 15, 10 to 15 centimeters long. I think they're beautiful, I realize that most people do not put beautiful and cockroach in the same sentence. But, as their name might suggest, if you touch them, they hiss. Some people think it sounds like a snake, some people think it sounds like a cat. Regardless, it is just a large insect making a loud noise and is usually enough to startle people. People ask me, does that like actually work? To that I answer that I would bring them around in my introductory biology classes. Everyone knew I had it, everyone knew it hissed. I walked over to a group of students, I touched it, it gave a really loud hiss. The students all screamed, threw their notebooks on the table, and ran to the other side of the room. <laughs> so, if it works on overworked, overtired college students, I hope, I'm assuming it works on things that I hope are less intelligent than college students, presumably mammals and birds. And here's the orchid mantis. Someone asked me what my favorite insect is. This is probably my favorite insect. The orchid mantis is so named because it is a mantis and looks like an orchid. The orchid mantis does not sit on the flower. The orchid mantis sits by itself on a leaf and its shape and its color, it comes in pink, white, and yellow, 
attract the pollinators. By the time the pollinators realize it's too late, it's way too late, the mantis has already grabbed them out of the air and is chewing off their heads. There is some evidence to suggest that the mantis looks more like a flower to the pollinators than the actual flowers do. This type of mimicry is called aggressive mimicry. So up until this point, we've been talking about mimicry very passively. I look like something else, so that way my, pre my predators don't eat me. Now it's the opposite. I look like something else to attract my food to me. We're going to go see fireflies tonight, for those of you who want to go on the night walk. Yes. <laughs> um, fireflies need to tell each other apart at night. They have different flash patterns and different altitudes at which they flash. So the species that are flying in the canopy are a different species than the ones that are flying in the grass. Of the ones flying in the grass, the one going bloop, bloop is a different species than the one going bloop, 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 sound effects included. <laughs> so eventually you'll get a female in the genus Photurus. She's not pictured, but you'll get a female in the genus Photurus, and she will mimic the flash pattern of other females. When the male of the wrong species comes in, she eats him. However, she is not chemically defended, and she will eventually attract a male in the genus Photinus. She will mimic his female. The, the male comes in to the wrong species. The Photurus eats him, steals his chemical defenses, and then passes those chemical defenses onto her eggs. Why make the chemicals if you can just take them from someone else? <laughs> Sounds easier. But sometimes just looking like what you want to eat is not good enough. Uh, this is a spider. It is mimicking a type of ant that lives here. Unfortunately for it, ants have a complicated biology. Ants not only need to be able to tell one species of ant from another species of ant, they need to be able to tell one colony of the same species from another colony of the same species. And they do this through a series of chemicals on their body. When two ants meet each other, they will tap their antennae and they ask three questions. Who are you? What are you doing? Where are you coming from? If you do not smell right, the two ants will battle until one of them wins. And if one colony is too close to the other, one will battle the other until one of them wins. This is great if you are an ant. This is not so great if you are a spider that likes to eat ants. Because now, all of a sudden, looking like what you want to eat is not good enough. So what does the spider do? It walks out to, this, to the edge of the colony and it finds an ant that's wandering around by itself. So here's the spider, here's its head and thorax region and its abdomen. It has grabbed the ant by the neck. So here's the ant's head, thorax, and abdomen. The, ant grab, the spider grabs that ant by the neck, walks up to the front door of the colony and says, Hey guys. And the other ants look at it and say, Well, you look like us, but do you smell like us? And they tap their antennae on their fallen sister. They say, you smell like us, come on in. So the spider walks into the front door of the colony, drops the dead ant somewhere near the entrance, and then eats the colony from the inside out. Wow. <laughs> but it gets crazier. We're not done yet. <laughs> what? This is a spider called a bolus spider. It likes to eat moths. Moths also have a complicated biology. A female moth will sit on a tree and she will release a plume of pheromones to, a tr to attract a male. The male will follow the concentration gradient of pheromones until he reaches the female. A male moth can spell a female moth up to, up to about 10 to 12 miles away. So it's a really effective communication system. This spider spins a web called a bolus. It's a long sticky string with a glob of glue at the end. And in that glob of glue, it, spent, it spins a chemical mimic of the pheromone that moths are using for mating. It spins the bolus around, wafts out that chemical. A male moth comes in thinking he's found a female by smell. The male moth hits the bolus. The spider reels him up and eats him. This is the same thing that we use in Agriculture is called pheromone trapping. You can make synthetic mimics of the chemicals that different pest species are using for mating. Uh, but, you know, this spider has a bunch of millions of years of experience on us. No big deal. And finally, it's not just arthropods that do this. Plants also get in on this action. This same biology can be found here in South America, but this has been recorded by David Attenborough, so there's a lot better pictures and photos and stuff. So, this is an orchid. It uh, it basically it 
preys upon a type of wasp. So this is the, uh, the important bit of the orchid. It looks like a female wasp abdomen, maybe if you are a male wasp, very blind, very drunk, and perhaps very desperate. <laughs> Poor chap. So this part looks like a female, but the orchid has another trick up its sleeve. It also smells like the female. It has a chemical mimic of the pheromone that that particular species is using for mating. So a male wasp comes into the flower thinking he has found a female by both sight and smell. And he will literally mate with the flower. There he is dumping sperm into the basin of the flower and the flower has dumped two pollen balls on top of his head. You can tell that he thinks something is wrong. He like tries to wipe the pollen off his head, but it's stuck there. And he will rinse and repeat this several more times and that's how these orchids are all pollinated. There are several different orchid species. Each one targets a different species of wasp. And with that, I'll take any questions. Here's a bark mantis from the cloud forest of Ecuador. Here's its head and its arms and its leg and its butt. Um, my friend and I, we run a blog tailor called Ask an Entomologist. My business card is downstairs. I forgot to bring it up. Anyway, um, so if you like bugs or now realize that you like bugs and have questions, send us an email <laughs> and we will get to it. But if you guys have any questions, I will take them.